everyone. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, it's our great pleasure to, to spend some time with you over this morning to give you some insight into who we are and what we do at Université Numérique, the French National Digital University. My name is Carole Charlie Stéphane. I'm based in Strasbourg in Alsace, Eastern France, and my disciplinary focus is foreign languages and humanities. I'm joined by my colleague Jacques Dong from Paris, who is involved with business and economics. And together we lead Université Numérique's outreach initiative to the global open education community. Jacques, can you explain the rationale behind our support from the Open Education Global Conference, as well as for our membership in the organization? In short, why are we here today? Well, thank you, Carol. First of all, I would like to say how glad we are to be participating in this great event. I remember expressing my regrets last year that I could not meet our colleagues from Taiwan, nor visit the National Palace Museum and its magnificent collections of Chinese art. Today, I regret that we are not actually welcoming our colleagues from around the world in Nantes just yet, but it seems that we probably will do it doing so next May, thanks to Colin Laidera and his team. So we've been members since 2017, representing at first business and economic departments at French universities. And I had the pleasure of meeting several presidents, past presidents, Larry Cooperman, William von Valkenburg, with a special mention for Sophie Touzé, whose enthusiasm and vision were key to involving us in this community. Since I met Sophie and Igor in Cape Town in March 2017, and even more so since December 2018, when we met Paul at the Open Education Leadership Summit in Paris, we've been fortunate to improve our understanding of the global open education community, its strengths and its great achievements. In addition to our meetings in Cape Town, Delft, Nancy, Paris and Milano, as well as online, we've been given the opportunity to better understand what wealth of knowledge and experience each of these great personalities brings to the global community. And we'd like to thank you so much for the insight you have provided with us with since that time. At the same time, we are also fortunate to benefit from an increasingly confident support from the French Ministry of, for Higher Education with Anne-Sophie Barthez, its Director General for Higher Education, her senior advisors, Luc Massou and Mehdi Garsala, as well as from the Conference of University Presidents. Finally, we're also very glad that we have a better understanding from our member universities, as well as the partners from Africa, from UNESCO and ICDE, of what we can bring and share with our colleagues outside France. So I believe the past four and nearly five years have allowed us to build a solid foundation grounded in institutional and human understanding. And we are ready to move forward as a sustaining member for Open Education Global to explore how we can cooperate further, both on overarching approaches as well as on more specific operational collaborations. I think now, Carol, would be a good time to explain who we are and what we do in order to give uh, more ideas to our viewers about possible areas for cooperation. Yeah, thank you, Jack. L'Université Numérique is first and foremost a meeting place where French universities and elite grandes écoles share their expertise and experience in the field of open education and receive advice and support when implementing the pedagogical and organizational transformations that digital technology technologies bring about. L'Université Numérique federates several disciplinary areas, business and economics, 
healthcare and sports, science, engineering, the humanities, sustainable development and technology. While they were organized initially as separated entities, they are now working in close cooperation as l'Université Numérique, the joint operator for the French Ministry for Higher Education, Research and Innovation, with the mandate to represent French higher education in international bodies involved in open education. Taken together, we represent over 29,000 open educational resources and a staff close to 40 full-time equivalents. I would like to stress the importance of scientific expert expertise. All of our open education resources are validated by thematic committees who played a vital role in our organization and operations. As Jacques mentioned earlier, we have extended and strengthened our international partnerships. He has described how our involvement with Open Education Global is evolving. We also have a very strong strategic partnership uh, working with the ICDE and UNESCO and OER in Francophone countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. We are working closely with the OER Foundation on a course dealing with copyright, intellectual property rights and licensing. We have also a strong presence as some international conferences on Leiduken in Berlin and e-learning Africa, for example. And together with European universities or networks, we have been partnering in European Union funded projects with the most recently a focus on competencies and skills, micro-credentials, and mutual recognition agreements. Moving on specific projects we are currently involved with. In the past two years, actually starting before the onset of the pandemic, but also as a result of the pandemic, we have been working in four different projects funded by the government that have one thing in common. They are willing and our capacity to enrich our catalogs with OER that can be used by universities in the curriculum of national degrees. They are granular in design, focused on one concept and no longer that 30 minutes in student reading time. They are reusable in different contexts, bachelor level or continuing education. And they are based on H5P technology. As mentioned earlier, we have a strong focus on cooperation with Francophone countries in Africa. We are involved in several initiatives, the most important one being the joint working group um, on the implementation of the UNESCO OER Convention with ministries, university, uh, universities, <laughs> sorry, virt virtual universities, UNESCO, UNESCO national conferences, NGOs and companies. We are adapted, adapting to the Francophone context a course offered by the OVR Foundation to the Global Community on Copyright, Intellectual Property Rights and Open Licensing. And we also contribute to the UNESCO Dakar Sahel Initiative and we have implemented several bilateral projects in Congo, Côte d'Ivoire and Senegal. Jacques will now describe a number of distinctive characteristics of French higher education and OER contexts that can give a better understanding of our goals and constraints. Over to you, Jacques. Thank you very much, Carole. So just a few words about the French higher education system. 
It's a dual track system with both state universities that represent the larger part of the student population and public or semi-public elite grandes écoles that are focused more on employment in the corporate world and recruitment for the decision-making tiers of the civil service. The public university system is more centralized than in other countries. We do have a ministry in charge of higher education and the autonomy of university is a fairly recent trend. It started in 2007. At that time, salaries and, uh, and of academic and staff were still managed centrally. And today, in many universities, it is still the case for building an infrastructure. We have mostly national degrees with a curriculum that is approved by the ministry. And we have also a centralized approach to the tenure track system and the management of careers of academics. On the other hand, academics enjoy a fairly high degree of freedom inside the university. So in a given field, we can have a great diversity of academic content between different universities within a highly regulated administrative framework. And the final characteristic of the French system is that we put as much emphasis on teaching, which is traditional, as well as on learning. We also have some specific traits regarding the OER landscape in France. French is the second most uh, taught language after English, but it lags very much behind English Mandarin in the number of open educational resources that are available. Furthermore, the legal context about the civil law versus common law, we have a contradiction between the non-revocable creative common licenses and the also non-revocable moral right of authors to withdraw of intellectual work. So there, are need, there is a need for mutual trust uh, for us in continuing relationship with authors so that, they, so that we ensure that their content is up to date that the underlying technology is up to date and that the author does not feel the need to withdraw his work from what is public, publicly uh, accessible. We also have no open university because uh, the ministry feels that an open university would compete with existing traditional universities in delivering degrees. We have a coexistence of various types of education and also the focus of e-portfolios in state universities is sometimes more about self-reflection than about exhibiting competencies and skills to potential employers. Finally, we have probably a blind spot in open textbooks because there is no financial incentive, nor, nor is there a, a great need felt by the students to uh, use open textbooks. So this is definitely an area where we can learn from our colleagues across the world. So how does this impact how we can partner with uh, colleagues around the world in the field of OER? The importance of trust, as I mentioned earlier in our relationship with Open Education Global, which builds over a period of time and is as important at least as important as meeting specific uh, objectives. Doing something that can be used by the general public in the general interest rather than for specifically targeted audiences is also important. The timeline for deployment can be also longer because of the need to achieve a balance or compromise in several areas, political, administrative, cultural, financial. And also, we have a tendency in France to favor abstract thinking versus operational deployment. When I first worked on an EU-funded project, my colleagues told me that we in France tended to not work on operational e deployment before solving the abstract theoretical problem. And that is true. And they also told us that we uh, appear to like it when the abstract solution is as beautiful as a quick temple. So this is, these are one of the few two things we need to keep in mind, the constraints we face when dealing with OERs with French partners. 
But having said that, I think we share a common belief, uh, uh, especially between uh, uh, Western and Eastern shores of the North Atlantic, between Nantes, which is not so far from the Bay of Biscay, and the, Bay, the Chesapeake, we share a strong belief that acting together as individuals as, and networks of individuals, as organizations and networks of organizations, and nations as a whole, we can, especially in the field of open education, make the world a better place for learners. Thank you very much, and uh, we are open to all the questions you may have. Thank you very much, both Jacques and Carole. Uh, it's a really impressive set of activities that you have just articulated during your presentation. And also from our side, from Open Education Global side, we are really pleased about these collaborations with you. And we are looking forward to continued collaborations into the future. Um, so I would like to encourage anyone who has some questions to please post them into the chat window, or you can just unmute yourself and ask directly. Uh, but in the meantime, I would like to actually ask a couple of questions from my side. And coming back to the digital thematic universities, I was wondering, I think maybe participants here might be wondering what kinds of resources have these universities been producing? Like how many open educational resources exist under the auspices of these universities? And if you are perhaps able to share any information about impact metrics of these resources, where are they, where are they being used by whom? That would be quite insightful and helpful. Um, and the second question uh, is related to the support that you mentioned of the Jacques of the French Ministry of Higher Education, Innovation and Research. And I think I would like to hear a bit more about what you mean by support. Uh, you mentioned that this, uh, this initiative was uh, launched by the ministry and it has been supporting this uh, initiative for a number of years. And as we know, uh, part of the one area of the recommendation of the UNESCO OER recommendation speaks about creating supportive OER policies, correct? Now, the way that governments can tackle support uh, for OER uh, varies. Uh, some have uh, put in place regulations or legislations. Some have uh, opted for more economic instruments, providing funding for, for different initiatives. So there are different approaches from different governments. But the fact that the ministry has been sustaining this kind of support for a number of years now, what is the rationale? Why does the ministry continue supporting this initiative over the number of years? Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, on the first question, we have about 29,000 uh, open educational resources at this time uh, with a very varying degree of granularity. They can be very short uh, uh, video clips or they, they can be uh, full fledged 30 hour courses. Uh, over the past uh, years, we have been uh, moving towards more uh, core, uh, content that can be aggregated into full 30 hour courses that are aligned with the curriculum of national degrees. This will make it easier for uh, to speed adoption by universities. And this also is uh, something that uh, African universities ask of us that we have full courses that can, they can then aggregate into a curriculum. Uh, some shorter courses are interesting for in terms of development for teachers, but we have we now uh, have a requirement for authors that they can be reused by other uh, teachers and aggregated into full courses. Uh, perhaps Carol has more insights into how they are used, and uh, I will address the second question. The ministry support has been has varied in intensity over the past 15 years and uh, and uh, it's only uh, since uh, just before the pandemic that we convinced the ministry that it would be useful to have a global usable repository of indexed content which is also validated from a scientific perspective. So at that time also the universities were engaging into their pedagogical transformation relying on digital technology. So there was a convergence between universities, the ministries and ourselves. 
And to give you an idea of the level of funding, we have, I mentioned that we have 40 full-time equivalents. They fund uh, about eight to 10 full-time equivalents. And we fund the additional through membership fees, but mostly through uh, projects, specific calls that we uh, answer at the European or the national level. Carol, perhaps something about usage. You are more keen on statistics than I am. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it depends on the resources. Uh, a, a, a part um, are used directly by the, uh, the student, and um, the, the most part uh, is um, reused by um, teacher uh, to th they pres prescribe the, um, the resources. Uh, on the student, or, or they re reuse all the, the contents for for the for for, for, for the teaching. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, one of our colleagues, Deborah Arnold, who is involved in uh, many the several European EU uh, European funded projects I mentioned, and she can perhaps she can uh, uh, also say a few words about uh, addressing the questions that are raised. Deborah. Thank you very much, Jacques, and uh, very pleased to be here with uh, with everybody. Um, just perhaps a few words uh, about the um, uh, the European level projects that uh, that we're involved in. We've just completed uh, the one that uh, Carol mentioned. Thank you very much. Uh, called Ellen for Life, which was about uh, uh, soft skills and active learning for employability. Um, and uh, we recently published a list of uh, 10 key takeaways, which are uh, open educational resources in their own right, uh, with recommendations and findings from the, from the project. Uh, I can, in a moment, because I'm not very good at multitasking, share the link to that in the, in the chat with you. Um, and uh, also, uh, we know that the question of micro-credentials is a, is a hot topic at the moment. There are several sessions um, at uh, OE Global on that. And uh, this is a plug for uh, Friday. Um, I'll be joining forces with uh, Lena Patterson and Tanis Morgan for a session, which in um, Central European summertime will be uh, eight o'clock on Friday. Uh, so that's my Friday evening sorted, um, but uh, obviously we're flexible uh, in order to connect with our colleagues around the, around the world. Um, and with Lena and Tanis, we're going to be looking at open futures for micro-credentialing. So not so much focusing on the technical aspects of micro-credentials, there's a lot of work being done on that, but really bridging the narrative uh, between open and micro-credentialing as a process. So if you're interested in that topic, then, then do come along. And that's related to our work in the ECHO project at European level, which as um, Carol said, we're um, uh, focusing on recognition, on the, um, the really technical and organizational aspects of what does it take to actually uh, issue a micro-credential and what are the benefits to uh, learners organizations and employers. So that's just a brief summary of, uh, of those activities. And then of course, the other projects on open virtual mobility, which we continue to build on. So if there are any specific questions about uh, those activities or others, but I think uh, the presentation already given by Jacques and uh, Carol gives a, a very, very good picture of uh, the situation in France, the specificities and the links with uh, the rest of uh, uh, the activities on a global scale. Uh, I see a question in the chat about result, reconciling common and civil law in relation to intellectual property. Uh, well, uh, the solution for us is quite simple, is to incentivize uh, both uh, financially and uh, also in terms of cooperation, the author, in order to convince him not to withdraw his uh, work from the public domain, uh, else he would be he would need to reimburse us the exploitation right we have paid for. So uh, I would say in a more positive way, we 
for, for the goal of updating the content of and keeping the work available to the public, we need to have a good long lasting relationship with the author. And we also want him to be involved in the community that we try to build around his course. And oops, it's, uh, uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Oh, open textbooks. Uh, Colin de Laiguera uh, from Nantes explained to me that when he sends students from France to the US, uh, well, they go to the library and pick up a textbook for two weeks. And, but that is not what the teacher in the US expects. He expects the students to buy the textbook and have it available at all times. In France, there is not that strong a pressure from the teachers to the students to ensure that they purchase the textbook. So uh, they borrow the textbook in the best case. And the teachers also focus very much on the PowerPoint presentations and the uh, uh, and the cases, the text cases they give out to the students. So in my opinion, it's a blind spot because we need to ensure that uh, students have available a textbook and we need uh, 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 for their learning. And we also need it for the teachers to be interested in providing it. So it's a blind spot. It's something that we have not addressed and that we should address to improve the student learning. There is also a question from Ayla here, uh, where she asks, so many students, specifically in Africa, have challenges with digital access. What provisions are made to assist with these? Are the courses downloadable? So here, I think, Ayla, you are referring to the, to the content of the digital thematic universities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's great that it's all digitally and accessible digitally, but that's not the reality for many people and for many reasons. So, um, you know, accessibility is an equitable issue as well. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. I can understand uh, the issue. Originally, there were, uh, the content was distributed uh, amongst a variety of servers in France. And in some cases, not downloadable. So this was an issue for us, as well as for learners elsewhere. So we have entered into partnerships with uh, various uh, entities. If we take the Republic of Congo in Brazzaville, we have set up with partners a fully accessible, freely accessible platform based in Brazzaville, so that all the content that is available on French servers is replicated there. In Dakar, in for the University Czech Antediop, which is the main university, we have copied the content of our servers to their own, to the local servers. And we also have in parallel a partnership with the Université Virtuelle du Sénégal for them to uh, host the content. I believe they host it in cooperation with Orange Middle East Africa. So there is not a, a one solution that is fit for all the situations, but the goal for us is to make the content more locally accessible uh, without undue interference and undue pressure from telecom operators. We do not, uh, we are not there to provide another reason to purchase a, a 4G uh, connection from commercial providers. We are here to uh, extend the educational opportunities for learners in Africa. But we also welcome any uh, additional solutions. In Togo, we've seen solutions that download to microservers, which, have, which are battery operated in case there is a problem with electricity. Uh, so, we are open to a variety, to a range of uh, solutions, and we are there to op offer the support and to offer it freely so that the goal of uh, access to students in Africa can be achieved. Thank you. Okay, do we have any additional questions? 
from the audience. Because if not, then I think that we can conclude. Uh, I'm also just putting the link again in the chat window for more information about Université Numérique. Um, so thank you very much again uh, to you, Jacques and Carole and Deborah, um, for your for your participation today and also for your support of the conference as a platinum sponsor. It's, it's highly appreciated. And if you have any additional questions for Jacques, Carole or Deborah, I think you can reach them directly on the OEG Connect space or otherwise feel free to, to share your contact details in the chat window. And uh, Deborah, thank you very much also for the pitch for your session and thank you for your commitment uh, for the 8 p.m. session on your side on Friday. <laughs> Um, you will, well, actually you will be doing it with um, our president of the board because Lena Patterson is now the new president of the board of Open Education Global, so that's also great. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I don't know, Jacques, or Carole, or Deborah, if you have any closing remarks. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone.